Hello, tonight we feature a session with Sheila Chandra. She sings four numbers in all, three from her latest album, and most importantly, one which she's written specially for us. Nothing else specially composed tonight, I'm afraid, but you can hear some electroacoustic wizardry from the French Canadian Robert Normando. Then there's a remarkable track from the new Radiohead album out tomorrow, which features Humphrey Littleton and his band. And I'm not joking. We've got some pre election madness from Cold Cut, and just straight ahead madness from improvising trio Bark. And if the idea of multi track viola, over thumping drums appeals to try and stay awake for hanged up and we start with perverse aptness you might well think with a track titled initial problem it's by a young mancunian whose real name is henry smithson but operating as he does in a field of dancey electronica in which real names are unofficially banned he has to go out as right on that's spelled r-i-t-o-n but who cares what's on the wrapper when what's inside has such a quirky funky jazzy kick to it here we go Thank you. 
Oh, well done, Henry. That was a track called Initial Problem. He goes by the name, of course, as Right On. And the album's called Beats Du Jour, currently available on Grand Central Records. I could see you tapping your feet to that, Mark. Yeah, I like that album. I've been listening to that a bit. It reminds me of a, a sort of very much more laid-back square pusher type thing, the way he he uses the sort of same fractured beats and electronic sounds. It, is it a has lot, a more sort of jazzy flavour to yeah, it. Yeah, much more, and it's a lot... It doesn't have that slightly frenzied quality that square pusher uh, injects into his music. But apparently he's... Um, He's a, you know, he's quite an active live performer, and it'd be quite nice to see if we can get him on one of our live shows. Definitely, because I'm a big fan of this album. Right now, it's a few years since we've played anything by the Canadian electroacoustic composer Robert Normando. Well, in that time, he's not been idle. He's become professor of composition at Montreal University, and along the way, he seems to have picked up most global prizes for electronic music. And he's found time to put out a new CD, which continues his idea of cinema for the ear. It's called Claire de Terre. And the title track takes as its inspiration a photograph of the Earth taken from space. And in each of its short 13 movements, Normando tries to uh, equate techniques of cinematography with musical sonorities. See if you can follow his train of thought here. Uh, We'll listen to rhythmic editing, followed by metaphoric editing.
two pieces from Robert Normando's new album, which is called Claire de Terre, and the tracks were Rhythmic Editing and then Metaphoric Editing, and uh, that's on the Empreinte Digital label, a Canadian electroacoustic label. Uh, three pieces in all on this uh, album, um, all written in the last couple of years, and uh, anyone who's interested in, in electronic music should try and get hold of a copy, I think. It's interesting how these electric acoustic composers, and he's a very good example, seem to be able to get a different quality. There's a sort of more highly crafted sheen to the sounds than the sounds that people operating in a more commercial or pop vein achieve. I think, I think people like him actually spend a long time developing their own sounds. I, I think they tend not to use um, synthesizers and sounds that have been programmed on these mm. things. On this album it actually says that, this, that he's, this is the result of his sort of ten years of experimenting with sounds. This is from his own personal sound library and I think that's why his pieces very much do have his own personal stamp on them. So it's electronic but it's handcrafted. Exactly. And now for the first instalment in our Sheila Chandra session. At this point in her almost 20-year career, Sheila is into delicately textured drones in which her voice mingles and merges with the multitudinous sounds of the Ganges Orchestra, which is in fact an alias for her musical accomplice Steve Coe. It's very much a studio construct, this, but that said, the Chandra Coe partnership had absolutely no problem recreating parts of it in a live session. This first piece was specially devised for mixing it. It's called 1111. Thank you. 
Well, the first thing I want to ask, for people who probably became aware of your music around the time that you put out your Real World albums in the 90s, and you got sort of drawn into the, the world music community, the WOMAD set, if you like, your music's moved on quite a bit from that. There's a wonderful density, one might almost say sound tapestry to this new album and in fact the performances that you've given for our session. It's great actually um, sometimes an album feels a finish, this one feels as though it goes on and on and it's been evolving through radio sessions. Um, I must say I've really enjoyed recording this because with the constraints of time it's forced me to record the guitars and the vocals at the same time and it's been such a long time since I've sung uh, with musicians because when I was on stage with the trilogy I was on stage alone that it's actually been you know a, a great experience that you've constructed for me. What are the main influences musically upon you currently? Well I think my music has always been influenced by that structure of raga with drone and for me the inspiration for melodies generally comes out of drone. The longest track on the album for instance of Bone Drone 7 is still where I'm chasing the elusiveness of the harmonics in the drone, the whispers of ideas and melodies uh, in the drone and I think this version uh, on This Sentence Is True really does get very very close to that experience that I have as a musician of, of hearing things, hearing full-blown performances almost uh, on the same, different things on the same piece of tape. If it's, if it's played ten different times I'll hear ten different things. And I think that's a magical thing about drones. Well let's talk about a bone crone drone. How is this one different from the album version? This one is very different because you can actually hear the vocal very easily. <laughs> on the album I've buried the vocals along with lots of other things. Why? Uh, other effects. Um, because on the album uh, the idea is to point people to the little dances of harmonics that are happening over the track so that the vocal is a signpost so that if you're, if you're not a musician and you're not used to listening out for harmonics and, and letting your imagination be, be taken away uh, with that then the vocal is there to, to lead you. What I've done for you in the studio today is to react to those harmonic dances myself so that this time it's much more a piece of performance art. I've not sung any phrase twice when I've been running through different takes. It's, it's completely what I've heard in the, on that piece of tape at that moment. And which version do you prefer? Um, in terms of singing, I think reacting to the drone as it happens uh, with the red light going, there's, there's, no, um, there's no experience to beat that.
Two numbers there in our session with singer Sheila Chandra. You just heard A Bone Crone Drone 7, and before that, 11 11, and a yeah. couple more later on. And she certainly has come a long way since she sang in that sort of Asian fusion pop band Monsoon back in 1982, I think it was. Now, our dear friends Radiohead are back. Only months after releasing Kid A, they're about to put out an album they might have called Kid B, since it was recorded at the same sessions, but instead they've named it Amnesiac. The sound palette is again sparse and harsh, with Tom York's vocals non-existent at times and tortured falsetto at others. Stirring rock anthems are still off the menu, but despite what the cloth-eared reviewers are saying, there's plenty of melodic invention and strange beauty on Amnesiac if you're prepared to pay attention. And for those who persevere to the final track, there's a truly delightful surprise. Radiohead in collaboration with Humphrey Littleton, who plays trumpet in the New Orleans brass arrangement of Life in a Glass House.
Radiohead and a track from their new album Amnesiac, which is actually out tomorrow, and that's called Life in a Glass House. I haven't actually heard this, but that sounded quite similar to Kid A, or it was in the same sort of musical area. Yeah, I mean, that track is, is probably one of the more distinctive, as in not like the tracks on, on Kid A. Quite a few of the songs here do almost sound like continuations of some of the some of the very sparse ideas on Kid A. You've got Tom York singing over a piano, you've got some very bare instrumental tracks. The, the only criticism I would make of this music is it does sound a bit sketchy sometimes, as though they've, they've almost left out too much. I mean, I like it, I like it very much, and I think it's very brave and very bold music. But there is a slight f- unfinished quality it has sometimes, but they, not on that track. And are they still uh, leaving off on the old guitars? The guitars are there, but they're, not, they're certainly not played with any sort of testosterone kind of charge or, or, or great energy. They're, they're quite languorous, sort of plinky things by comparison to the guitars that, that they played on OK Computer, where the guitars sounded like futuristic electronic cellos. I mean, it's, it's, it is a very downbeat album, and it's, you know, as we know from talking to them, it, was a, it reflected the slightly troubled frame of mind in which they made it. So not the great commercial album that some people have predicted after the experimental Kid A? No, it's rather funny that that got out of the bag, didn't it? Because this is so not the, 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 the commercial leap back that, they expect, that people were expecting them to make. Anyway, right, well, on to Bark now, who are a British improvising trio comprising Rex Caswell on guitar, Philip Marks on percussion and Paul Obermeyer on electronics. And what I like about them is their sense of fun and their lightness of foot and that they sound like one very complex organism when they play. Here, for example, is the title track from their new album, Swing. If one day I meet a being from another planet, I very much hope it sounds like this.
Bark, not as in J-S, but as in B-A-R-K exclamation mark, and that's the title track from their new album, Swing, which is on Matchless Recordings. I certainly take your point about the... Uh the sound of sort of uh, recreational aliens there, Mark. That did rather remind me of R2-D2 after a sort of <laughs> thoroughly extraterrestrial booze-up. But I think it's amazing that three people can actually play like that together. I mean, it doesn't sound like any sort of effort is going into it. Uh, I mean, um, there are they do very different things on the album as well. There are sort of more sort of ambient, floaty sounds as well, but it's uh, a remarkable improvising album. Are they this. kicking in lots of samples? I don't, qu- I don't quite know how they do it. It doesn't sound like samples. It sounds like sort of randomly generated electronic noises Perhaps that Paul Obermeyer is doing. should get them for a session and study what they're doing <laughs> to close quarters. They have offered themselves for a session, so maybe hmm. we'll follow that up. Now, back to our Sheila Chandra session now. Two more pieces that appear on her recently released 10th album, This Sentence is True. And sandwiched around, not a word in the sky and true, some more elucidatory chat from the artiste herself. Not a Word in the Sky really highlights one of the emotional themes of the album uh, because although I I started this uh, album as a very fun project, it did very quickly develop a a cohesive emotional theme which is about the uh, delight and distrust in words and the dilemma we have as human beings about the fact that we are vibration sensitive but we're also word sensitive. We've uh, come to embrace words in in such a manner that we forget that they are symbols and they are not the things they represent. They can be so concrete uh, for us. When you're listening to music it's time to get back to the fact that things should be a gut experience, should, things should hit you on a, on a gut level, on a visceral level. Um, Not a Word in the Sky represents one of the extremes because the whole album explores that theme. It's it's the track which is at the word beyond symbol, almost something concrete, end of the continuum. It's about someone who hasn't spoken with anyone for four or five years, is, is adrift somewhere and has become rather psychotic about words or perhaps knowing about words, um, experiences the birth and death of words, and is also thinking about their in tuneness with what they represent. So it, it's also all in part an homage to um, Space Oddity in the David Bowie track, the idea that someone could be cut off in that very, very, how cruel it is to be cut off from words and from human contact. So that song has quite a strong narrative to it almost, or a submerged narrative. Indeed, yes. Yeah. Sky. And if liquid. 
liquid could speak. I believe it has age and language. Each drop could tell us its name, its story, maybe how in a past life it died happy as it fell into the sea, resolved, dissolved, but not forgotten. Words seem to mock shocking in the deep, deep chill of this vaporous quill. There they sit still, not a word in the sky. Sometimes I see only vowel harmonics in a consonant sky and the energy that writes me knows, shows, the being flows and stretches, without a world, yet within, not a word in the sky, I sigh. Not a word in the sky. Obviously, you've recreated these four tracks for us this afternoon in, what, about four hours or perhaps even less? How long does it actually take you to create one of these tracks? I mean, say, the track True, for example, which you've done for us. How long did it take you to do it when you recorded it for your album? These recordings took about two years to mature. I couldn't pinpoint in that time how much time True took up particularly. But I think it's rather like uh, watching a Zen monk paint the the time is the thought process before the brush hits the paper and the grinding of the ink stick in the water to produce that very very dense paint there's a density of ideas required there's a, a courage in terms of um, being able to go beyond what one expects oneself to sound like what others expect one to sound like and also in terms of the structures that have become so familiar to everyone. I mean, we're all Closet Radio 1 listeners in, in some sense, in the sense that we have that kind of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, 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 chorus thing coming at us on all sides, whether we choose to hear it or not. And I think we are very influenced by sounds that we believe to be right or wrong. On this album, I think emotionally it's taken to even a, a further degree because I've attempted to contrast serious noises with apparently ridiculous noises, and that's part of the vocal collaging uh, that I've been doing. I really want people to think about, on, a, on that gut level, uh, what is serious and what is ridiculous, and how much of it is to do with how it's presented to us, the setting in which it's presented to us. Espírito Santo
That was the last piece in our Sheila Chandra session. That was called True. Our thanks to her and to the musicians who played with her, who were Nick Pullen and Bruce Seward on guitar, and Steve Coe, who does sort of general soundscaping. <laughs> More music from Montreal, Canada now. This is uh, very different from Robert Normando's electronic soundscapes we heard earlier. This is Hanged Up, a duo featuring Genevieve Heisteck on multi-tracked viola and Eric Craven on drums. An unlikely instrumental combination, but it seems to work rather well. There's a kind of middle European feel to it, and I strongly detect the influence of singer and fiddler Eva Bitova. Their new album's called Simply Hanged Up, and from it this is Winter National.
band and the album are called Hanged Up, and that was Winter National, and it's on the Constellation label. And if you'd like details of that or anything that we've played tonight, you need our playlist, which you can get in the uh, usual ways. Write to us, BBC Broadcasting House, London, W1A1AA. Look us up on CFAX, page 652. Email us, mixing.it at bbc.co.uk. All the details will be on the web, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 3 forward slash. Only four days to go now, and then we'll all be put out of our pre-election misery, apathy, rage, or whatever. So, we leave you tonight with a track which puts the leaders of all of the major parties in their place, buried deep in the mix of a juddering dance track by Coldcut, with their emptiest words come back to haunt them. We return next week with an all-CD edition. Until then, good night. Good night. <laughs> we got to get them straight! Utterly, utterly out, out of control, control. control.